Good morning. Welcome to our The Latest Science and Social Research, How Women Are Affected. These are panel of TED Talks by Columbia and Barnard professors. I'd like to first introduce myself. I am Lisa Rosen Metch, class of 90 from the School of General Studies, and I have the honor to be the new dean of the Columbia School of General Studies, the first alumna dean. <laughs> There's nothing more exciting than to return to your school that was so transformative for you and now have the chance to work with the amazing students at our Columbia School of General Studies. I am happy and honored to be here today to introduce and moderate this illustrious group of women. Each professor in this session will share some of her latest research in a short TED talk-like presentation, and there'll be time at the end for questions. We have mic set up in, in the uh, audience here. So keep that in mind that you'll be able to come up at the end after you hear from each of the speakers. The focus of these wonderful talks is very much on the theme of this conference, She Opened the Door. You will hear about opening doors for women in prison, for women dealing with urban slum issues, and for women striving to balance an academic career in the sciences. This will be such an exciting and interesting panel, and there's so much to share with you, so I'm so thrilled to get started. The first speaker is Professor Geraldine Downey, the Niven Professor of Humane Letters, who is a former chair of the psychology department and currently directs the Center for Justice, a center that I'm proud to be a member of and is doing such important work. Professor Downey will be addressing why higher education in prison for women matters for the health and well-being of fragile families and communities. I am thrilled to welcome Professor Downey. I don't want to outstay my welcome, so. <laughs> So I'm really delighted to be here to talk about the work that we are doing here at Columbia um, on uh, teaching in prison. Uh, I view that as something that I do as an educator, as well as something that I learn about uh, or I learn from and comes into uh, my scholarship. So every year when graduation rolls around here at Columbia, Professors uh, like me, and like all of us on this panel, feel very much affirmed in um, our ability to support young people in making the transition to adulthood. It's a relatively easy job here at Columbia. We get terrific students, we get faculty and deans and an institution that's committed to their success. But on graduation day at Columbia, I'm also reminded of the young men and women um, at the other institution where I've taught throughout my career. Um, young people like Kenya, uh, who's on the right here, um, I met her when she was a seven-year-old visiting her mother in prison. Kenya went to prison herself in her 20s for selling drugs to uh, make ends meet. This was during the era that saw the US becoming the leading incarcerator in the world. Uh, with an increase that was most pronounced amongst young people who dropped out of high school, young people from fragile families. You can see again on the right where the increase was uh, the most. Uh, during this period, there was an almost 800% uh, increase in the number of women behind bars, especially women who were black and Latino. Kenya came home from prison very much committed to turning her life around, but she was stymied in doing so because of her criminal record. So every year that I, I ask myself at gra on graduation whether we can find a more effective way to support the transition to adulthood for young people like Kenya who have faced a lifetime of marginalization because of a criminal record. Now today, the transition to adulthood spanning the years 18 to 25, is emerging as a distinctive period of the life course. Young people spend much of this time in college. 
college completion is becoming essential to making a living wage and to navigating a world of increasing complexity and rapid change, a world where the demand is for uh, people who can uh, anticipate and solve problems rather than simply follow uh, orders. College is the new normal today, with about 86% of high school graduates going on uh, to college, even those who didn't expect to do so. Yet a very troubling um, uh, uh, number of young people spend much or all of this time in prison, and they enter adulthood without the preparation to succeed. This is especially true of young black and uh, women and men like Kenya. They grow up in very challenging circumstances, um, such as having a parent who's uh, incarcerated or dropping out uh, of high school. And when they finish their time in prison, uh, they come home uh, to their communities with criminal records that severely constrain their opportunities for employment, uh, for housing, for college, and in many states for participating uh, in, in the, what's the civic right of citizens, that is voting. These restrictions may be intended as community or safeguards, but they conspire against the stable and strong engagement in marriage, in parenthood, in work, and in community. Roles that promote the ties and routines that scaffold success in adulthood. So as someone who studies uh, adult identity, and especially uh, rejected identities, I've been very, very interested in what it means to be seen as having a criminal identity uh, versus a student identity. And to be upfront, I'm a very uh, strong believer that promoting the student identity amongst young people with a criminal record is a much better way to go than the current approach to punishment, uh, confinement, and permanently de degraded uh, citizenship, which characterizes uh, our approach to young people, especially young people of color who run into difficulties. So let's consider the contrast between the criminal identity and the student identity. The student identity is uh, defined by hope. It's an aspirational identity uh, for just about everyone. It's what parents want for their children. The criminal identity is defined by history, a focus on one's past, one's mistakes, one's failures. It's a stigmatized identity that inspires fear and dread. College students are defined in terms of their accomplishments, their strengths, their potential for success. The criminal identity is defined by limitations and by deficits. We believe in college students and we're willing to support and help them uh, in achieving their potential, in finding and following their passion. We doubt people with a criminal identity and we surveil them for signs of danger and we clamp down when we perceive them. We're warned to be suspicious of them. When college students graduate, we remind them in our graduation speeches that the future is limitless, that they are our future. When young people leave prison, we remind them to think in terms of the constraints that they face, the careers that are off limits to them uh, because of their conviction, and the sanctions that they face if they break the rules, such as 9 p.m. curfews. The gap between the lives of young people in college and young people in prison has become much more pronounced in the last few decades. Opportunities to be a student in prison almost disappeared in the mid-90s when the Get Tough on Crime uh, ethos deemed college education in prison to be a luxury rather than a necessity for a safe democratic society. When people came home from prison, the emphasis on criminal disclosure, uh, criminal history disclosure, having to check the box, um, continues to remain an obstacle to becoming a student. And I'm glad to see that evidence uh, that it's driving potential uh, applicants away led the SUNY uh, system recently to join the California system in no longer asking this question. Criminal history also uh, remains an obstacle to employment and to housing. So it's not surprising that 78% of 18 to 24 year olds who are released from prison or jail are rearrested within uh, three years and 50% return to prison, very often on technical violations. But 
This is a moment of possibility as everyone is reconsidering the nation's uh, approach to criminal justice. And it's well established that taking on a, a student identity when in prison is a pathway to success. Being a college student in prison is the best known or, uh, uh, protection against recidivism. It cuts it in almost half. And the uh, recidivism rate for people who complete their education, uh, their college education in prison, is almost negligible. So why don't we treat young people in prison more like we treat our students, as engaged learners who can be scaffolded towards healthy and fulfilling lifestyles that keep people out of harm's way? Um, why is there reason to believe that this is a better approach uh, than the one that emphasizes punishment and um, exclusion? Well, research in psychology and neuroscience is showing a much longer period of brain malleability, as well as of openness to social and cultural influence than was ever thought possible in the past. This is both the strength and the vulnerability of adolescence and young adulthood. It means that when nurturing rather than negative opportunities are in place, there's a great potential uh, to nudge young people uh, towards successful adulthood. This may be especially true for young people like Kenya um, who are sensitive to their environments and who have both the motivation and the potential to change. And college educators have learned to be much better at nurturing the growth and development of uh, students from a wider variety of backgrounds and histories, including those who enter college in adulthood. Our School of uh, General Studies is a real standout in this regard. Every year I meet extraordinary students in general studies who believe that they would always be defined by a tumultuous uh, adolescent to a brighter future, especially for those who are committed to overcoming uh, a bleak past. So I've idealized the uh, student identity, and let me tell you why. I met a student while I was volunteering in um, prison, and she taught me uh, why this is an identity worth idealizing. Um, she, when I was a new PhD, the University of Michigan, where I was a postdoc, asked me to be the liaison with Mary Glover, um, who, uh, while incarcerated, uh, decided that she wanted to be a college student, like the men uh, in, who were also incarcerated, including her husband. And she uh, sued the Department of Corrections to get access to college education for women. Um, her efforts to become a college student uh, opened the door to many other uh, women, uh, including uh, Kenya's uh, mother. And Mary's commitment to an identity that gave her hope inspired me to become a, a college professor. While she was the first to uh, uh, convince me of the importance of education in prison, she wasn't the last. The elimination of public funding of Pell Grants in 1994 in prison ended colleges in prison throughout the country. And the women inside Bedford Hills Correctional Facility here in New York State, including Cheryl Wilkins and Kathy Bodine, who are my colleagues now at the Center for Justice, came together with private universities, including the School of General Studies here, to bring college back. The Bedford Hills College program became a national model and inspired the new uh, pilot uh, Pell Grant initiative that's now supporting higher education uh, in, in prisons. This is another example of women with radical hope uh, who defied their history uh, to open the door to college uh, for women and men. Um, so what does college in prison mean to students in prison? Uh, my students tell me it means that they are courageous, committed, um, creative knowledge seekers, determined to make something of themselves while doing their time. It means they are resilient enough to rise above the daily horrors uh, in prison to make it to the classroom. It means that they have the patience and self-discipline that it takes to get the kind of clean disciplinary record needed to be considered uh, for a college program. It means that they have the perseverance and humility to make up for the earlier education that they missed. 
As one student put it, um, no one, this is a student in Sing Sing where I also teach, um, no one ever believed he'd be taking Columbia classes and having the kind of conversations that he has today when he dropped out in third grade. The student also said that college and prison was a more effective form of rehabilitation than the other programs in prison because, because it reflects a choice, a choice to become someone different, uh, a choice to give back. And it is um, the other programs, the mandated programs uh, that happen in prison are there to remedy deficits. Another student um, captured better than anything that I ever could uh, uh, in, uh, uh, what it means to take Columbia liberal arts type education in, in, in prison. When he said, this class changed the way I view the importance of academic education. It not only opened my mind, it allowed me to express myself freely and therefore acquire a level of understanding that made me aware of my responsibility to society. So how do we support people in prison to see themselves and be seen as students with the potential to grow and to develop rather than as prisoners of their history? How do we use contact with the criminal justice system to be a turning point towards a hopeful future rather than a gateway to permanent exclusion. We're joining with multitudes of others, including um, many people who've come home from prison throughout the country in efforts to answer these questions at the Columbia Justice and Education Initi Initiative and the Center for Justice. And I'd encourage you to come to our Beyond the Bars conference, which, or to at least to, to look at it online, um, which is happening on the 1st to the 4th of March. Um, so let me just show you, these are um, some of the women who've come, ho uh, come home from Bedford Hills talking at a conference here recently uh, about uh, what, what the, that college program meant to them. And this is actually the one that I wanted to show you, um, which has uh, Laura Chukowski, um, uh from, the, uh, from Earwags um, with two of the students who recently graduated uh, from Taconic uh, cor Correctional Facility, where Laura was their teacher. And what I would say about this is that anybody who's ever gone to a prison college graduation, um, and this was the first one that took place at Taconic in its history, um, uh, would agree with me that prison graduations instantiate what the Irish poet Seamus Heaney meant by a moment in time when hope and history rhymes. Um, so the answer to my question Supporting the student identity can help foster the transition uh, to a successful life for everybody, and perhaps especially for young people like Kenya. So these are some of the guys from Sing Sing talking about their, um, uh, at a conference about their uh, experience in college and what it meant for them. But this is a picture of Kenya. Um, and she uh, came home, from, she came home from prison um, about eight years ago. Um, she was really, uh, determined to turn her life around. And I'm very, very proud to say uh, that she is defying statistics and on her way to celebrating a graduation from something other than parole. So thank you, and I <laughs> hope I... Thank you, uh, Professor Downey. That was very powerful. Um, our, our next presentation is from a team of professors, Anna Paulina Lee, the Assistant Professor of Latin American and Iberian Cultures at Columbia University, and Anupama Rao, the Tao Associate Professor of History at Barnard College and Associate Director of Columbia University's Institute for Comparative Literature. Anna and Anu are directors of a Women Creating Change Project, Geographies of Inequality, Gender and the City. Women Creating Change is a program within the Center for the Study of Social Difference, engaging feminist scholars to focus on contemporary global problems affecting women. Please welcome Professors Anna Paulina Lee and Anna Pama Rao for their TED Talk here today. Good morning. 
Now, as the world continues to urbanize and globalize, the global population of slum dwellers also continues to grow. UN Habitat estimates that nearly a billion people live in informal or substandard housing settlements known by the catch-all term slum. In fact, urban slums are today the fastest growing human habitat across the world. Now, slums are called favelas in Latin America. They're called kampungs in Southeast Asia. They're called gekekondu in Turkey and basti across many parts of South Asia. Now, they go by different names, but they share something in common. These spaces describe the geography of inequality. We associate these places with social exclusion, with the stigma of poverty, and with routine violence. But we tend to forget that slums are produced by social forces, by state indifference, by poor or inefficient planning, by political corruption, and by the unequal distribution of resources. And we rarely think of the people who come from these places, who live in slums, as agents of change, as having something to teach us about creative strategies of survival or human flourishing, especially if they happen to be women. But women have been at the forefront of struggles for housing, for sanitation, and safe space across the world's slums. Now, it may not surprise you to know that women routinely had households that survive on their hard work and sacrifice. But how many of us know that women are at the forefront of international human rights organizations like Slum Dwellers International, an organization that brings slum dwellers across vast geographical and political divides, and that seeks to transcend social differences of race, of caste, of religion, and ethnicity. Now, at Women Creating Change, we approach issues such as the right to housing, safety, education, sanitation, as women's rights and human rights issues. Our project, Gender in the Global Slum, works collaboratively and comparatively and seeks to harness the collective power of women who have engaged in struggles against poverty and precarity. Now, how do these women approach global processes, such as urbanization, migration, and large-scale economic transformation in unique and interconnected ways? What can we learn from women and from their struggles for dignity and self-worth? Thinking globally while respecting social histories and social uh, histories of difference is what defines and distinguishes our approach. Costinha is Rio de Janeiro's largest favela. It is also the largest favela in all of Latin America. About one in four people who live in Rio, a city with a population of about 6.4 million people, live in a favela. Most women who live in favelas work as housekeepers for the city's middle class. They earn an average of 40 US dollars a day for about 10 to 12 hours of housekeeping work. Often they travel two hours or more to get to work each way. Women's labor is thus underpaid, and oftentimes it's unpaid. Though their labor keeps Rio's middle class households running, they often do not have access to basic services like sanitation, running water, electricity, and they definitely don't have access to daycare. At Women Creating Change, we begin with the premise that housing inequality is at the root of women's poverty. Housing inequality not merely describes a lack of basic services, but it actually jeopardizes social relationships, the relationships that are built on care, intimacy, and security, the very things that define our idea of home. The women I have worked with have struggled to keep their families together and their children safe in an environment that treats them as though their lives do not matter. 
they have resiliently faced social exclusion and race and class-based discrimination that excludes people and their families for the reason of merely that they cannot afford safe and secure housing. It is due to women's creativity that Hosinga is not a deprived shanty town. But because of their hard work, it's actually a thriving city within a city. There are over 1,250 commercial businesses in Hosinga alone. And women have been at the forefront of entrepreneurial endeavors, from selling cakes and cookies and coffee on the street to opening their own bakeries and restaurants. It's also where you can find some of the best sushi in town. <laughs> Women have been at the forefront of entrepreneurial endeavors. They have also fought to defend their businesses against gang extortion and exploitative landlords. Our work at Women Creating Change is dedicated to making their contributions vocal and visible. As early as 1977, a group of women organized um, and took over the Association of Residents of Hosinga. They created cleanup crews, and fought for a campaign to build a footbridge to connect Hosinga to the rest of the city. Even though Hosinga is located directly next to the wealthiest neighborhoods in Rio, until then people had to cross a major freeway just to go to work. Individual women like Francisca Pirozzi have made their mark as well. Francisca struggled to take classes in preschool education so that she could open a preschool in Hosinga to educate the young children of working mothers. Celebrating women like Francisca and their achievements, however, does not mean that we're ignoring the kinds of urban poverty and violence that impact women around the world. But it does mean that when we learn from and listen to women like Francisca, we can devise better strategies for change. Women have been at the forefront of desegregating housing and education. You know, it takes skill and resilience to navigate life in a slum. Mumbai slums are dense settlements that require insider, uh, insider knowledge to get around. People build their homes with tin and plastic and then wait to be able to afford cement to regularize these homes. They routinely tap into existing power lines for their electricity, and they illegally extend the city's water pipes to access potable water. Men and children often sleep on the streets at night and risk, run being, risk, uh, run, uh, risk being run over uh, because there's no space inside their homes. Now, I call slums self-housing. These are works in progress that people create and adapt to suit their own conditions of life. Now, over 60% of Mumbai's residents are classified as living in slums. Slums take up about 11% of urban land in Mumbai. Mumbai's current population is 22 million. So we're talking about 12 to 14 million people who live in makeshift shelters in the fourth largest city in the world. Dharavi, Asia's largest slum, itself has a population of over 1 million people. Now, policy planners and government officials tend to think about slums as being data dark, as being off the grid. They're anything but that. These are thriving centers of economic activity. Leatherwork, garment production, recycling plastic, separating garbage. These are just some of the activities that you'll find in Dharavi today. The annual revenue in Dharavi exceeds a billion dollars a year. Um, and you've got 5,000 businesses and 12,500 single room factories in Dharavi who generate this kind of economy. Leather goods from Dharabi routinely make their way to high-end fashion houses in Europe and in the United States. Animation studios in Dharabi produce content for Hollywood as well as for Bollywood. Now, spatial differences are anchored by social difference. 
And what you often have across Mumbai are slums situated next to high rises and posh bungalows. Because bungalows and posh towers depend on the cheap labor of slum dwellers in order to survive. So in Mumbai, the high rise and the slum, the intended and the unintended city coexist. But they exist in parallel universes. One is legal, it's recognized. The other is subject to routine demolition and evictions. This indeed is the geography of inequality. And it's anchored by social differences of religion, of caste, of gender, and class. Now, everyone works in the slum, but women work especially hard. One of the people I work with, Kunda, works in eight to 12 homes every day. Suhaila is a child minder. Now, their employers need and depend on these women for their own labor. But neither of them is able to make sure that her, ch her child goes to school. Roshan is a daily wage construction worker. Her labor involves carrying bricks on her head for eight to 10 hours a day. Now, other women in slums opt for home-based work. They make pickles, they fabricate jewelry. Almost all of them spend hours every day waiting at public water taps to fill their buckets. You'll often see young girls on trains in Mumbai selling cheap toys and plastic hair clips. Now, everyone, every woman who works in the slums is subject to catcalls and much worse. Sexual harassment is rampant in these spaces. And jilted lovers have been known to throw acid on unsuspecting women. Most of the women that I know avoid going to use public amenities. Toilets rarely have water for washing, and most of them lack the privacy of doors. But despite all of this, women have come together and routinely do so to fight for their rights and to struggle against demolitions and evictions. M Ward, which is near Dharavi, contains one of the largest populations of slum dwellers across Mumbai. Many of them have actually been relocated from other parts of the city. Now, this area is known colloquially as a dumping ground, but it's anything but that. The group known as Spark teaches women construction work so that they can struggle for formal housing and build the homes that they want to live in. The group called Herbs challenges the idea that all slum dwellers want to escape their homes and leave the slums, and instead tries to work with them to develop creative strategies of self-housing. Muslim women who have been forbidden from attending government schools have created women-led madrasas in the neighborhood. This is a young group of girls who are coding. Almost every woman that I know in slums has historically struggled and organized to fight the political power of builders who are seeking to relocate them and use slum land to build high-end housing. Women have run for elections and engaged in mass public protests. So all of this goes to show that women engage in public activism in addition to the invisible labor that they perform on a daily basis. M. Ward, Dharavi, Hosinia, all of these spaces reflect the paradox of the slum. These are spaces that are thriving with the creative energy and activism of women. But they're also places of economic desperation, of sheer state indifference, and failed ambition. Urban segregation and social exclusion is as much a problem in the United States as it is in Brazil and India. Through our collaborations in Mumbai and Rio, we are gaining a global perspective on our massive housing crisis. And we are finding that women are at the forefront of finding solutions and building bridges. They have shown us that the slum or the favela is a place of innovation, dignity, and resilience. Their work is our inspiration. But how do we work with them and enable creative solutions? We are reimagining the space of the classroom and developing teaching models where we bring Columbia students into collaborative projects with students living in M Ward and Hosinga. 
We empower college students in New York, Mumbai, and Rio to transcend differences of class, race, nation, and caste. The, we encourage them to work together to imagine new, equitable, urban futures. This is possible because students see connections between Rio's favelas, Mumbai slums, and urban poverty across the United States. And they see that these spaces are intimately connected. They are learning that housing inequality and women's strategies for survival are everywhere. In our mixed classrooms, students come to see slum women as scholar practitioners who have much to teach us about survival and resistance. Our work at Women Creating Change pairs the power of digital technology, feminist pedagogy, and social action to enthuse students to become thought leaders for finding sustainable solutions for the most pressing issues of our time. Our work is already expanding. We are now collaborating with scholars working on Detroit and New York, Beijing and Manila. We believe this is only the beginning for modeling social action based in feminist scholarship. Thank you. That is, all of this is so inspiring. Um, so our last presenter is Gordana Vinjuk Novakovic, who holds the title of university professor here at Columbia University. And this title is really reserved for the small number of exceptional faculty who have made monumental contributions to their field of study and serve Columbia University as a whole. Uh, Professor uh, Vunjak Novakovic is a leading expert in engineering of human tissues for regenerative medicine and modeling of disease. Uh, Gordana today will speak about her research and how to balance a career in academia, specifically in the sciences, with having a family life. We are thrilled to welcome you here. No, it's not mine. Thank you. Thank you. It's really a pleasure to be here. This is a wonderful conference, and we are all very grateful to Linda and others for making it happen. So um, what I would like to talk about is this recurring theme of finding the doors, the right doors, and opening them. So I'll start from thinking about an event 25 years ago. So I was a newly minted assistant professor in my home department in Belgrade in Serbia. And I was lucky to get a Fulbright Fellowship for a year to go somewhere to try to find my real interest in science. And I went to MIT and there was a man, Robert Langer, probably the most famous engineer in the world and um, most cited person in the history of humankind in any kind of engineering. So he's a real giant. And at the same time, very kind person who really helped me find what I want to do, and he opened this door for me. And this was a totally transformative event for me, for my life. And this is something that I'm really trying in some way to do myself for my students today. So the door that he opened for me was that leading into tissue engineering. So this is an area that was just emerging at that time in early 90s, and it's one of the most active areas of uh, science today. Uh, basically, the vision is, uh, it's the vision of the humankind that we would love to live forever and be young and healthy. And to this end, we really need to overcome the problem of our failing organs. So the life science and then engineering merged towards developing an ability to grow biological replacement for our worn out or defective or missing tissues. The philosophy, the approach behind it is actually very simple. The cells are the only engineers of the tissues. Only cell can build a tissue. So what we do is actually enable the cell by providing the right environment. And the impact of this is basically to provide 
one-stop body shops, so to provide um, uh, this uh, capacity to um, repair tissues and organs in a way that fits our individual needs. I'll show you a couple examples. We can grow today living human bone in the correct anatomical sizes, and we do that from the patient's own cells. So you do grow your own bone. It's totally tailored to your body. And this is how it would work. So we get the cells from blood. We take images of the defect, turn them into three-dimensional files, make scaffolding material, put it into the culture system, get the bone at the end of the process a couple of weeks later, and then implant into the patient. We can also grow beating heart muscle. So what you see here is a human heart muscle, and you can grow this from for any of us. So you just take a very small sample of blood, isolate stem cells, and then technology comes into the place and you get this muscle. Why is this useful? You can study development, you can model diseases, you can um, uh, uh, support the development of the drugs. To this end, we also combine this muscle, which is schematically shown here at the top, with other a tissue and organ system. So you can make a small platform that is called sometimes organ on a chip platform, sometimes microfluidic platform, where you combine heart and liver and skin and vasculature and plus minus some other relevant organs so that you can study effects of drugs. For example, we are uh, building and using these platforms to study the effectiveness of anti-cancer drugs and also to off-target effects of these drugs on other organs. So you can really help balancing the dosage and the treatment regimen and also to help develop some modalities that are protecting the organs that shouldn't be targeted by these drugs from their adverse effects. And the last example I want to show is the lung. This is an absolutely magnificent organ of enormous complexity. So what you have in your chest is um, uh, uh, there are two intertwining structures. So this is your airway where you breathe in the air, and there is the vasculature. And between them is a surface which together for the two lungs is as large as the tennis field, tennis court. So it's huge. And we cannot even think about building this lung from scratch like we can do for bone or heart. So there is a problem that was brought to us by clinicians, which is that lung transplant, which is a life-saving intervention, is really hampered by the lack of lungs for transplant. And then the crisis is further augmented by the fact that they need to reject four out of five lungs that are received here in hospital because they don't travel well. By the time they come to the hospital, the quality goes down. They're not good enough for the patient. So it's a real crisis. And so what we have done together with clinicians is to develop a technology that starts from this unacceptable lung. I mean, you can see here, whatever is white is not perfused with blood, it's not functional. This corresponds to these dark areas here. So you start from this unacceptable lung and over about three days, you bring it to the state which is, uh, sorry, fully functional and this lung could go to the patient. So this is still on the road to clinical studies, but actually with a lot of promise that this technology may benefit patients in near future. So this is the science, just to give you an idea like what are we doing on a daily basis. <laughs> <laughs> and now I would like to talk about some uh, general things. So uh, my job is really to think about the problems. Like, what are the problems we may be able to solve so that we can make difference in human health, in human life? So this involves actually mobilization of the young talent. And this young talent comes in various shapes, you know, from various backgrounds, and you need to really uh, uh, keep them intellectually engaged and happy and try to really uh, help them find what they want to do in their professional life. 
Uh, this also involves a lot of side activities that are be, uh, not really science. So we have this tradition of thematic birthday cakes. So on one occasion, I got this cake uh, with a heart patch. So we are studying these patches to you know, treat infarction. So you can see everyone got a kind of cake that is compatible for, with what they do. And there is a lot of extracurricular, extracurricular activities. And I would just like to highlight one. We have this other tradition of running New York City Marathon. And I was looking back since I came here in 2005. Uh, every year, we invariably have three or four girls running marathon and completing New York City Marathon and making the rest of us feeling inferior, you know, for like <laughs> quite a while, quite a while. So... Uh, the, the work we do is really uh, uh, going to make an impact on, uh, on humans if we translate it. It has to be translated. It's not a basic science. So we are launching companies, and then these companies are actually being founded by my students and myself who participated in the work. So we work together, publish together, file patents together, and then found companies. And interestingly, these are the first three out of four that we have so far. CEOs of all these companies are young women. And I'm very proud of this. And then, I mean, this is really helping change the scene of biotech in the New York City because this is something that you see a lot. Okay, so let me finish with a few slides about lessons learned, if you like. And... Uh, some comments about science versus normal life and other uh, aspects of our jobs. So first of all, life in academia. I always wanted to be in academia, and here are some of the reasons. It's really very stimulating and rewarding intellectually. And the best part of it is this opportunity to mentor young talent. I think this is the absolutely best thing that I'm doing. And I follow some advice of my parents and my mentors, which is they need to be better than we are. If you don't raise the bet generation of students that are better than you are, then you, something is wrong because they're starting from much better conditions than we were able to start from. The reality of academic life is this here. Our door is never closed, and I mean literally, like never closed. And work is never done. So it's, it's, it, it's always something because you have this passion that's pushing you ahead. So it is really a lifestyle. I mean, it's not, it's not, it's not a job. Uh, how to do that? So here are some of the recipes. I think the most important thing is to try to get the absolutely best people you can and let them do what they want. I mean, not to manage them, not to tell them this is your project and this is what you're going to do, but actually just to inspire them to find their own way and support them along the road. It is very important in the areas that are changing quickly, like biomedical engineering, to train people in concepts and critical thinking. Because my students starting PhD, who is now, say, 21 years old, will be at the peak of their career in 20 years. And they have no clue how the world will look in 20 years. So they need to learn how to operate and lead in these changing environments. We also train them something that we all, I'm sure, learned in our professional career. Being selective is extremely important. Deciding about many, many things that you will not do so that what you do, you do properly and you are best in something. And Probably the last most important thing is you need to, to do something you really love to do. If you enjoy your, your work, then everything comes somehow by itself. I mean, not by uh, uh, effort. Mm -hmm. Work and life. So there is life. So <laughs> what I'm trying to show my, my trainees, my students, more by example than, than by words is, A, your family is most important, really. But then your work is also most important. So you have this, you know, but. Uh, 
reality is there is never ever a perfect time for anything. I mean, <laughs> to have a kid, to move to a different place, to write a book, to accept this invitation to give a big talk in Sydney, Australia. It's never perfect time. And so what you need to do is just, I think, first of all, be brave, not to be afraid of opportunities, but then rethink constantly and regroup, re get reorganized. So in this process, I think it is very important to keep our goals. Your goal should be there. But then your strategy how to get there may be changing you know, monthly, weekly, daily. So this is probably one of the, one of the ways how to, how to survive. Um, and then in addition to really loving what you do, I think if everything else fails, there is this sense of humor that you really <laughs> need to have so, so that helps you survive. And the last slide, and the sort of circling the loop back to this opening the door slide, um, I really think that science is awesome. I mean, I love science. And there are many, many doors leading into many different areas of the science. And in the way that Bob Langer helped me get oriented and find the right door, and then being kind to open this door for me, I would really like to continue doing this for my students. Um, I also try, while looking for these doors, there are big doors and small doors, I mean, it's important that young people who always want to, you know, to save the planet in one way or the other, they need to think big. They need to go after this fundamentally transforming ideas that will really make some difference in someone's life. Uh, to do that, they also need to try hard. Things don't happen easily, and, 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 and uh, talent is important, but persistence is equally important. You need to be very stubborn to succeed. You need to try, and then you fail, and then you do it again and again, and at the point when you think, oh my God, how many times, then it clicks, and then finally you get where you were trying to go. And, I mean, Along this path, professional career path, I mean, it's very important to have life because I think that I'm much, met, much better wife and mother and friend and daughter and everything because I have my own dream, professional dream, and vice versa. I mean, I'm much better at work if I have this really, you know, like a healthy situation at home. So I think both is very important. And one of the, the things that I'm, um, I'm really passionate about is uh, promoting female talent at all levels. It's not only about students and postdocs. We have this huge attrition as you go up. So this is really like to, to support my trainees when they get faculty position, when they move up, to recommend them, to try to help them to really get to executive positions, leadership positions, because this is where we still don't have as many women as we would like to have. So I think this conference is definitely helping in this respect. And uh, thank you so much for being here this Sunday morning. And uh, thanks, Linda, and others for organizing it. I'm going to leave this slide up because I think it's, it's so inspiring. I think this morning was so special. Um, just hearing about, I think, bringing all three, three uh, talks together, it's really about creating the social conditions, the social context that allows uh, major important and great things to happen uh, for women and for their communities, and it was just all ex very exciting. I want to take a moment to ask um, someone to stand up. This is Linda Uri Greenberg, who can stand up. She is from the Office of Alumni and Development here at Columbia, and she really brought this whole thing together. I want to again thank our phenomenal professors, and I ask them now to please come up to the front here, and we will have some time for questions. Uh, before we do that, I want to mention in the app that you have, when you go to this session's description, there are links to more information about the books written by our professors, about the missions of women creating change, um, and the Center for 
for Justice at Columbia University, as well as more information about Professor Vinjek Novakovic's lab. Um, so we have now, I believe, about 15 minutes or so for questions. There are two uh, microphones in the, in the middle here. I encourage the incredible women, alumni, uh, faculty, and, and, and friends of Columbia that we have in the room to please come up to the microphones if you have any questions or uh, want to hear a little bit more about some of the issues today. OK. Yes, go ahead, please. And if you don't mind when you come up, because again, this She Opened the Door conference is also about networking and for us all to get to know one another. So if you could introduce yourself when you uh, ask the question. Sure. Good morning. Um, my name is Justice Betty, class of 2018 GS. And I have a question for Professor Downey. First of all, thank you to all of our speakers this morning. It was absolutely fabulous. Um, Professor Danny, there's been a lot of conversation on campus about the Ban the Box campaign, which, as you alluded to, some universities have already gone ahead to actually remove the portion of the application that asks for an applicant's criminal history. Can you just share with us a little bit more about the status of this campaign or the movement in terms of the mobilizers and any potential advocates for this issue? And perhaps the second part of my question is, in a world beyond the box where um, individuals who are formerly incarcerated are accepted into universities, what might you expect their integration process to be like when they arrive on campus? So thank you very much for this question. Uh, one of the, 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 the leaders in this effort to get the, beyond the, uh, to, to get the box removed is Vivian Nixon, who is currently a student in the, uh, uh, in the School of the Arts, but she has been a leader in um, College and Community Fellowship, which is a program for women uh, that support women coming home from, uh, from prison to get into college. Um, she worked with some, uh, somebody at the University of Syracuse and showed that uh, when people have to check the box, they drop out of the application process. And that, that evidence, uh, at, at, a, at a much greater rate, about 60% greater rate, that evidence helped uh, turn around the SUNY system, and they've removed the box. Uh, the University of California has never had it on, the system has never had it on, on uh, their, their application. So there is a huge movement that's very, very strongly supported, uh, and supported by the evidence throughout the country to take the box off. Um, there's no evidence whatsoever, and this is true both in, for students as well as for employment, that there is any greater risk um, to having people with a, a criminal record and, uh, on, on campuses or in uh, jobs. Um, and so the, uh, the, the movement on uh, campus here has resulted in the school of um, the, the social work school and also the school of um, the, the graduate school removing the box. And my hope is that general studies will go ahead and also remove it as well as the other professional schools. There is a lot of uh, momentum and support for students in doing this. And the second question was how do we integrate students who come home fr from prison on campuses? Um, we, uh, there's a program here at uh, Columbia called the Justice and Education Scholars where students who, uh, who come home can take a class and then uh, move on into taking other classes depending on how well they do in, in that class. Um, it, 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 the, the students who come home from prison, uh, like any kind of students who have been um, uh, recently integrated into Colombia, that includes women. Um, uh, they, they, it, we need to do the best we can um, to, to make this uh, possible, have, have it in a way that's, that's effective and successful. Um, we should know how to do it, but, there's, but it, it's again sort of opening the door and making sure that people feel welcome and making sure that they have the supports that they need. When people are in prison, they have not access to the internet. They haven't access, they, 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 they don't have the opportunity to make the choices that we, have to, we, we make in our daily life. So there's many ways like that um, th that we need to, to work to support the integration. Um, we ha but we have a program called the Directly Impacted Group here on campus uh, that's for students and, and faculty and um, administrators who, um, are connect who either themselves have been to prison or have a loved one who has. 
And they are do, do a tremendous job in helping that integration. So that's the, they're the kind of programs that are needed. Uh, so thank you. Great. Thank you for that question. Uh, other questions? Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. And please introduce yourself as well. Good morning, everyone, and thank you to all of the uh, professors for our really inspiring talks. My name is Ellen Sinrush, and I'm a graduate 1982 of the law school. Um, I have a question for about the uh, slum dwelling and the geopolitical uh, separation and segregation. Can you describe some of the work you're doing here in the United States and how, um, how people who are not necessarily involved at Columbia University might participate or volunteer their time? Um, so thank you so much for that question. And I think this goes right back to what um, Anna ended with, which is that one of the things that we're really interested in doing is breaking down this idea that you know slums and favelas and so forth exist in other parts of the world, and that we're not confronted with the same questions of deep, deep spatial segregation, histories of racialization that have enormous impact today on I think what the sociologist Matthew Desmond has called the eviction economy. And he's actually traced the fact that you have got impoverished families and families very often from uh, African American and, and Latino backgrounds um, who are unable to actually capitalize and accumulate because of the cycles of eviction that actually destroy any possibilities of acquiring or accumulating stability. Right? So one of the things that we've been doing um, in the kind of pedagogical work and outreach work that we do um, is to really, we've got a, a colleague of ours who works in the United States and who works in Mississippi and is working with impoverished families um, and women who are really struggling to kind of work around questions of health care, uh, to challenge you know, poverty and the politics of poverty and so forth. And so what we do is to try to link similar issues between the places in which we work and some of the issues that are taking place in the United States. You know, there is, there is Harlem, there is Mississippi, there is Chicago where I grew up. And so there are ways in which, you know, once you begin to break down this optic that there are only other parts of the world that deal with, you know, mass poverty and slums and the process of slumification, we actually begin to recognize that these processes are happening all around us. Um, and so in terms of the kind of impact and involvement of people, uh, we work through a model of, of, of reading groups here on campus. And I think all of us have spoken to the fact that it's very important for us to work within and without the academy and to think about a classroom that is not just within Columbia University, but takes, in a sense, the world as a classroom. Um, so we do take very seriously sort of working through working groups, working with community engagement and social action projects and also trying to develop this kind of pedagogy, critical thinking, which I think Gordana was suggesting is really important um, in order to actually get people to think in a much more global, comparative, and connected frame. Great, thanks. Yes, please come. Good morning, Cynthia Stewan. Uh, class of 87, uh, School of Social Work. And right now, in my retirement phase, I am a rep at the United Nations. And I'm just wondering, piggybacking on the most recent question, um, <clears throat> about the Sustainable Development Goal, Agenda 2030, and the work that you're doing. Um, I mean, goal number one is eradicate poverty. Goal number five is supporting equality of women across the globe, and we're just in the first um, phase of the 15-year agenda. What role you are you interacting, of course, with that agenda? And I think what you're doing here could be a very um, uplifting opportunity to share it, if you haven't, uh, with countries as they come up with their uh, annual reviews on their progress with the Sustainable Development Goals. Thank you so much. Um, and of course, you know, UN Habitat and a number of other previous initiatives have also thought about the right to housing as a kind of fundamental space from which we can think about global inequality, 
Right? Yes. And so I think the sustainable development goals um, also open up some new frontiers that perhaps you know, we've not been thinking about in an integrated fashion. And that has to do with climate catastrophe and the way in which you know, I can, um, and I think you know, Anna will jump in and also tell us about what's happening in Rio, but certainly in Mumbai, sort of you know, processes of concretization, of you know, running over you know, live rivers, killing off the mangroves. So there's a very intimate way in which slum communities are inhabiting situations of climate precarity, mm -hmm. right? And not just you know, housing inequality. So it seems to me that the new sustainable development agenda by the UN, the 2030 uh, project, is also trying to think in a much more complicated way about, the way, you know, about ways in which housing, gender inequality, resource generation, survival, is really working with a model of climate precarity and, and kind of resilience that has to be thought about in a kind of planetary way. Um, but thank you for that. We've uh, not yet made our forays into, into the UN world, but we would love to um, hear and connect with you some more on that. Thank you. Thank you. And one of our approaches also, in addition to um, what Anu just mentioned, is really taking a holistic approach to thinking about the spaces of favelas and slums, which have historically not even existed in maps. So until recently, if you just take a, you know, go to Google, you can't even, they're just empty spaces. So what does it mean, you know, not just to live there, but to things like history and memory of those spaces that in Rio have been there for 100 years? So the right to housing equality is also about the right to memory, the right to history, the right to owning a history that is largely excluded, but so deeply part of urbanization history of Rio, of mm -hmm. Mumbai, of the United States, of New York, mm -hmm. and here. So a lot of the work we're doing is working with residents, researchers based in the spaces, students based in the spaces, to do oral history testimonies about the history of that. You know, what are the streets according to the residents? What are the histories, the memories? And so one of the things that we're doing now in Rio is a music archiving project. And we're gathering all the musicians who live in Hosinga and, you know, recording songs, gospel, Arabic music, for all these music genres that come out of, you know, these spaces where you wouldn't think that they're there, but telling a history through music. So things, you know, really asserting a right to a memory also. A postscript. And I think we were talking about women of all ages. Mm -hmm. And I really uh, want to emphasize the fact that you're talking about thinking in a paradigm shift. So thank you. Thank you. Okay. Go ahead, please. Come. Hi, good uh, morning. Uh, my name is Adria Armbruster, CC98 and um, Public Health 14. Um, I have been thinking about um, an issue that I think is shared uh, at least between these two presentations having to do with urban slums and also the issue of um, uh, incarceration and education. Um, and that is the role of media in really perpetuating a stereotype of both African Americans, if we know the numbers, these are high numbers, but 27% of African Americans are living in poverty, which means that over 30% are in the middle classes and, and above. Um, I live in a city that is predominantly African-American and Latino <clears throat> in Westchester. Um, and if you speak to anyone about Mount Vernon, they don't know that 15% of people in Mount Vernon are poor and 85% of, of people in Mount Vernon are middle class mm -hmm. because of the kind of media um, sensationalism of anything that happens in Mount Vernon. It's the same for favelas. Um, being in Brazil, I did a tour of Cocinha and I told people and they, passed out, like, oh my God, you went in there, are you dead, what happened? So how do we, <laughs> how do we, or what types of interventions kind of with, we have a lot of people here who are from the journalism school who really, you know, work in these areas. How do we start changing people's fears um, around the numbers of, you know, horrible people who live in certain places so that they can really start participating and having impacts in, in um, social inclusion? That th this is a really, really important uh, point that you've brought up. Mm -hmm. Because when, when you hear about criminal and when anybody who goes into a prison uh, is really struck by the fact that most of the people in there are black or brown, 
Uh, when I teach in Sing Sing, I have, uh, which is the men's prison, um, most, almost all of the students are black or brown. And they're extraordinary students, but that's not what you hear about them. You see, on all, they, they are, even if uh, a program on television um, is not focused on uh, them particularly, and I'm thinking of something that I saw in Chicago Med this week, uh, they use people in prison as a foil, as the baddie, and, and exaggerate uh, in extraordinary ways uh, what uh, the, the deficits or the ba what's bad about or what might be bad about uh, people in prison. So the media, I feel, has a lot of responsibility uh, for uh, um, perpetrating stereotypes uh, and that end up um, having real consequences for people's lives. People um, who, when they come up for parole now, having spent most of their lives in prison, and are older people who are not going, who we know that the, the, the risk that they'll commit crime again is extremely low. They're kept in because of some portrayal of somebody like Willie Horton in the media. Um, and so th this is, what we've been trying to do is work with um, professors like uh, um, uh, Francis Negron Moutonier to uh, come up with short videos that, are, that give a different portrayal. And that's sort of one of the ways that we've been doing it, that, 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 def that show the alternative to the stereotypes. And I think that, that we need to teach our students, we need to uh, be very aware uh, of what the media is doing. But sort of within the criminal re uh, justice reform movement, I think we also need to be very aware of not uh, talking about the good criminals, the ones who use drugs and who are nonviolent, and then demonizing uh, um, other people with other kinds of, of convictions. And, and so that, that's sort of a, a, it's something that we've been working on as well. But, but another thing that, that uh, a class that I've been doing, and this was actually an idea um, that uh, Lucy Lang, who is a graduate in the law school um, and is now the director of um, uh, the uh, District Attorney of Manhattan Academy. So, she t so she's responsible for the training of all the prosecutors that come in. So we're te co-teaching a course that has uh, uh, men who will soon co be coming home from, um, from prison uh, and ADAs in the same classroom. And they, these are natural adversaries. Uh, but, but what they're doing is talking together about how we can make safer communities um, and really defy and, and change stereotypes. And so that kind of you know, connecting across difference, I think, is another way that the media um, and that classrooms can, can help to, to change. The I, would, I would like to add something uh, along the same lines. Uh, I think that New York City is really like the world in small. Mm -hmm. And we have this phenomenal opportunity that is like a lab that we can pursue different initiatives and study different problems. And these are some of the examples of the work you do. And uh, something that people like me are doing are we have kids from under privileged communities mm -hmm. that are in high schools that mm -hmm. come to our labs and then they work and we help them to get to the next level. We run classes for them. We are building into our NIH grants funds for dissemination, for going to out you know, to the community, not only to tell them things, but also to listen what mm -hmm. they have to, to tell to us. So this interaction is, I think, uh, critically important. And then obviously you can, some of the things that you develop and learn here, you can then translate into other areas of the country and, and uh, end of the world. No, at those pipeline programs are essential. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. No. So I just well, want to, I think we're getting the to the time. Sometime. If we could <laughs> if we could have a round of applause for our amazing <laughs>